Today, we'll speak about the next matter, the next thing, which is how to abandon attachment to the good and the evil in order to have or realize a new life as was described yesterday. We have to study, observe and examine the penalty or pain of attachment. This needs to be seen both within ourselves as individuals and within society. It's necessary to examine how attachment arises, to, to note the cause of the arising of attachment. We have two ways of studying this. The first way is externally, and the second way is internally within. In order, as far as the external observation and examination goes, we can go to the various books and sources of information which can point to, to this. Our main sources are books and information which points out the history of the human species. Back in the early stages of humanity, when there was the being that we call ape-man, this ape-man didn't know good and evil. But as the ape-man evolved and developed into more and more human stages and levels of evolution, at some point the ape-man became human enough to know good and evil. And once, once knowing these, it attached to goodness and evil. When we see it from the external view of the history of human evolution, we can see the cause of attachment to good and evil arising in this way. We can interpret, it, interpret the story of Adam and Eve, which we discussed yesterday, where Adam and Eve disobeyed God, were disrespectful and disloyal to God to the point that they disobeyed his order and ate from the, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. We can interpret this to describe that point in man's evolution where man, where the important change occurred, the transformation from the ape man that didn't know anything about good and evil. When we say that Adam and Eve disobeyed God, that they were disrespectful of God. What this means is that at this point in human evolution, man stopped 
following the flow or the man began to break away from the original nature, from the original state of the mind and started to go in the opposite direction. In going against the original nature of things, we can say that this is being disobedient to God. The method of interpretation that we just used was one kind. And there is another kind or method of interpretation which we can use to interpret the same story. This first interpretation was in people language, the common everyday conventional language of relative truth that most people use. However, for Buddhists, there is another kind of language that is quite different than people language, and we call this Dhamma language, the language of ultimate truth, of reality. We need to understand the difference between these two languages in order to penetrate to a deeper understanding of things. So when we interpret this story in terms of Dhamma language, we get a much more profound meaning. The infant, the unborn child in its mother's womb has no knowledge of good and evil. When it is born, when the child is newly born, it has no knowledge of good and evil. But as it grows, as it comes into contact with the various objects of the senses, as its parents take care of it and raise it, feed it, clothe it, as people begin talking to it, in all this activity, in the socialized socialization that begins to take place, the infant is taught the meaning of the words good and evil. When it is first born, it has no knowledge of good and evil. But as it grows, it is raised in such a way that it develops the knowledge of the meaning of good and evil. And when, as this knowledge is begun, then there is attachment to good and evil. This attachment grows and further develops, becomes more ingrained and becomes more habitual as the child grows into adulthood and on into old age. This attachment to good and evil will continue until death, unless somewhere along the line the necessary knowledge for abandoning this attachment arises. Attachment either continues until death or until there is the right understanding that helps or that leads to the abandonment of attachment to good and evil. This is how we interpret this in the language of Dhamma. In either method of interpretation, the result is the same. Attachment and the problems that arise from attachment. If we wish to interpret this biblical passage 
from the point of view of human history. That's fine. And see that at this one point in human evolution, at that stage, man began to know good and evil. These words began to have the meaning of good and evil. And there was attachment to these meanings, the meaning of good and the meaning of evil. This original sin was then handed down from generation to generation until this very day. This original sin of attachment to good and evil has been our inheritance through all the generations until today. We can interpret this passage in, in these terms. Or we can look at it as a Buddhist would. As a Buddhist, we want to see it on a deeper level and understand this more profoundly. And so we see that this passage is referring to the transformation in the infant from the state of innocence, of not, not giving any meaning to good and evil, to that transformation into the state that is no longer Excuse me. The, when the infant is born naturally, this process happens naturally. This transformation naturally takes place, which results in the, the growing of the meaning of the words good and evil, and then attaching to these meanings. And then through that attachment, there is dukkha and all the various problems. We can use either interpretation. They don't disagree with each other. There is no contradiction or conflict. But we prefer the second interpretation because it is deeper and more profound. We don't have to see that, we don't have to think in terms of some original sin that is inherited through the generations. But we can see the original sin as it happens in the evolution of each human being. So in this second interpretation, we see how the infant begins to take certain experiences as pleasant and satisfying and gives this, and this becomes the meaning of good for that infant. And other experiences are taken as unpleasant and dissatisfying. And this grows, becomes the meaning of evil. And so through this, good, the meanings of good and evil begin to have value and then are attached to. So we have these two methods of interpreting this. If we would like, there is a third method which views things on an even more profound level than either of the first two methods. When we examine this issue with this third method, then we see that there is only nature which follows according to the law of nature. There is only nature and its lawful changes, the changes 
and transformations that occur according to the law of nature. Man, through his ignorance and stupidity, takes his own feelings, these, these judgments of pleasant and unpleasant, satisfying and unsatisfying, takes these feelings as the standard. Through this ignorance and this judging, good and evil begin to have meaning to the ignorant mind. As soon as man stops taking these feelings and judging the things according to them, then all that is left is that original nature. The original nature hasn't gone anywhere. It's always been there. But through these petty conventions of man's whereby we judge according to our own feelings, according to these limited, these limitations. The original nature is obscured. But as soon as we stop that, the original nature is realized again. And there is no attachment to good and evil. This is a a more profound way of viewing this issue. This is really a very simple matter. It's just a matter of nature. Nature proceeding along according to the law of nature. Nature in its original state. And there is man following and in agreement with this original nature. But then at one point man goes crazy, becomes insane, and gives, comes up with these crazy ideas of good and evil and attaches to them. But as soon as man gives up this insanity, and returns to the original nature, then it's all back to the way it always was. It's a very simple matter. It's just this insanity of man's and the return to sanity. It's all just a matter of nature and natural processes. Take, for example, the rain. There's water in streams, rivers, lakes, and oceans. This evaporates. And this evaporation of water lifts up into the air and gathers together in clouds. And as the precipitation in the clouds builds, it reaches a point where it falls as rain. It falls on us and makes us wet. It also allows the rice farmers to plant their rice and other farmers to grow their crops. The rain itself is just part of a natural cycle flowing according to the laws of nature. But we humans derive different advantages and disadvantages or benefits and problems from this, from this rain. And then we go and attach meaning to these benefits. If something benefits us, then we say that it is good. We give it the value of goodness. If something causes us problems, then we say that it is evil. And so some of us view the rain 
as evil, as bad, because it is uncomfortable for us or inconvenient. Other people, such as the rice farmers, view it as good, because from their viewpoint, it's what they need. It gives them benefits. It makes them happy. And so they give it the meaning of good. These words just have value in terms of their relationship to us and our, our way of viewing things. But really, these are just our, our conventions and illusions. And there is, there is no real ultimate truth in these words good and evil, yet we attach to them over and over again. If we wish to go deeper into the human mind, then we can look at it in this way. There's the infant that knows nothing of good and evil, but as its life carries on naturally, there are, it meets up with various sense objects through the sense apparatus of the eyes, the ears, the nose, the tongue, the body, and the mind. With these sense experiences, the, this infant that lacks knowledge will always be reacting to these experiences. There will be certain experiences which it finds joyful, pleasant, happy. With this satisfaction, with the pleasure and enjoyment of these experiences, the infant begins to uh, discriminate and distinguish these as good, begins to identify them as good. And with this identification as certain things as good, it begins to attach to them as my good. And there are other experiences which are not enjoyable, which are unpleasant, painful, displeasing, disturbing. These, the infant, takes to be evil or bad. It begins to discriminate in this way, to distinguish certain things as bad. And then with this kind of identification of things as bad, then it attaches to them as this is bad for me, or I am bad, or this is bad. And so it's through human ignorance, the lack of knowledge and understanding, that leads to discriminations of certain things as good and others as bad. And in this way, attachment arises and grows and builds, and we're mired in this kind of life. So that was looking at it in terms of the individual. Many individuals make up a society, and in society there is also taking the judging or discrimination of certain things as pleasing, enjoyable, and attaching to them as good, and other things as unpleasant, disturbing, and attaching to them as bad. So even on the level of society, of the group, there is attachment to good and evil. Through this societal or cultural attachment to good and evil, this is codified or systemized in religion, in organized religion. 
And so we begin to have words like merit and demerit or virtue in sin, which are societal discriminations based on what pleases and displeases the society, what is taken to be good and evil for this society. These, these conventions, which are originally used just to maintain the survival of society, are attached to and become dogmatic and ossified. So attachment also ha functions on the cultural societal level until the point where we stop doing this, where we let go and abandon this attachments, whether on the individual level or on the societal level. We call this letting go of attachment the new life. But really, as it's been described be already, is this, is, this new life is really just the return to the original nature of things. And so in fact, it's an old life, very, very old, older than old, so old that we can call it eternal. But for most of us, we've never seen this. And so to us, it's quite strange, this old, old original nature. And so to us, it's new. And because of this situation of its strangeness for us, because we're so unfamiliar with it, we're now calling it new life. But when we really understand it in terms of nature and the law of nature and natural processes, then we see that it's not really a new life at all, but it's the old life, the original life. But for now, we call it the new life, whether it's functioning on the level of the individual or of the society. The meaning of good and evil expands and spreads. There at first is this attachment or identification of things as good, as the good. But then the tools and mechanisms by which we, we strive for the good, by which we obtain the good, these tools become good we attach to them as well. And then the, through the attachment to evil, the tools and mechanisms which bring about evil, which lead to evil, these are attached to as evil. So besides the original discrimination and attachment to good and the good and the evil, then there are the tools of good and the tools of evil. And in this way, the, the meaning of good and evil expands. And it continues to expand. That results in the future. Things that happen in the future are also distinguished as good or evil, depending on our discriminations and judgments of how these things affect us. And the causes in the past are also discriminated as good and evil. And so we go through past causes and future results and the present mechanisms and we distinguish them as good and evil, attached to them. And in this way, the problem of good and evil expands, takes up more space and causes greater problems. If we want to see it in terms even more closer to us, 
even more easy to understand terms. And we think of the word boon or merit or virtue and whatever whatever gets us what we want whatever obtains those pleasing satisfying things that we've attached to this we consider to be merit or virtue this is the good and on the other hand there is bop or demerit sin which is whatever leads to those things that displease and dissatisfy us and so good and evil expand into merit and demerit into virtue and sin into happiness and dukkha if we take it in even more narrow terms we have happiness and dukkha when when this happiness is something we attach to as good it's something that pleases us that we like and so that's good happiness is good this is another attachment we have and then dukkha is something we don't like we don't want it's not at all pleasant and satisfying so we we say that dukkha is bad so whichever way we look at it we see these discriminations always categorizing things as either good or bad constantly over and over again throughout our lives so good and evil keep expanding in meaning including all sorts of situations and possibilities like let's take one that is something you'll all be familiar with which is very very important in the world we come from this is the, the situation of profit and loss when we get into some business venture we invest and if we make a profit we attach to this profit we we dis, we identify it as good this profit but the other side in the business transaction will see it as a loss and so for them the loss is bad they identify it as bad so profit and loss also take on the expanding meaning of good and evil or we can see in in other relationships between people where one person has the advantage and for that person that's good or when a nation has the advantage that's good this is taken as good cherished as good but there's got to be the other side that is on the disadvantage and for that person or that group that is evil which they don't like at all or we can see it as winning and losing in the competition that is so much of a part of our lives one side wins the other side loses for the winners it's good for the losers it's bad and so good and evil spreads into all these different areas of profit and loss advantage and disadvantage winning and losing spreading out into all these different areas in all these different 
dualities in all these pairs of opposites. Good and evil expands in this way. Now these different pairs of opposites that we've discussed, you've probably had, you've had knowledge of these already, but obviously you haven't understood them completely. These pairs of opposites are things that we genuinely need to understand and to see as fully as possible. They're always causing all sorts of problems through this attachment to good and to evil. So we need to look at these different opposites and see what is at work. The most powerful of these pairs of opposites, which has such a profound and strong influence on our lives, is the opposite the opposites of male and female. These are also aspects of the attachment to good and evil. The sexes are just a natural occurring separation of functions. It's just a natural mechanism used in propagating the species. And sexual instinct is another natural mechanism which, is, which nature has developed in order to continue the various species. So then there is the female sex which in order to, for it to fulfill this sexual instinct, the female has to find a male in order to respond to this sexual need it has. And so it attaches to the male is good. And for the male, in order to fulfill its, the sexual instinct, it needs the female and attaches to the female as good. And so male and female are attached to as good for, by the, the respective sexes. And these grow in importance. And through this attachment, our vision is so obscured of the way things are. Through this attachment, all kinds of problems develop through, through clinging to this is male and that is female, and through all the, the seeking and desiring that goes on in trying to gratify these sexual attachments we have. So we can see that in, in the, pair, the, se the male and female sexual pair of opposites, we can see how this attachment to good and evil develops into a very, very powerful influence, very powerful force in our life, which is constantly disrupting things and is always dragging problems in to the situation. So we need to study these pairs of opposites and understand them, especially this one very powerful pair of male and female. Let's look at the world, take a look and examine the world and see all the hassles, all the difficulties, all the crises that arise because of the, para, the, the sexual pair of opposites, because of male and female, because of this attachment to good and evil. 
see all the difficulties and problems that we must go through and we suffer because of this attachment. The way we do so many things, just in, just, uh, we do so many things because of the influence of these pairs of opposites of maleness and femaleness. The way we dress, all the problems we go to in finding clothes or jewelry or arranging our hair, trimming our beards, painting our faces, all the various things we do to beautify ourselves just because of this sexual pair of opposites. And the way we eat, it's always changing from time to time the ideal way a person should look. And so we've always got this problem of eating in a way to achieve that ideal which is expected to catch the opposite sex. And the jobs we do and the way we make our living and the way we behave, the way we talk and walk, the things we do are always under the influence of this pair of opposites, always doing things to attract the opposite sex to fulfill this sexual need or power or desire. Even in homosexuals, we can see that there is still this need for the opposite sex. The male can't be gratified by the male. The male needs a female for gratification, and the female needs a male. So even in homosexuals, you see that the, ver the different partners play different roles because they need this op there has to be this opposition in this attached, deluded attempt at fulfillment. And so all these various problems that are caused by the sexual pair of opposites brings about problems in all sorts of areas of life, in economic areas, in social, in health matters, in political, religious. On all levels, this problem of male and female is always exerting a powerful influence so we can say that this is the last of the pair of opposites because it's so strong and it's something that affects all of us, every one of us. It's a burden for even the most common and ordinary person. So this is a pair of opposites that, of opposites that we really must understand and get to the bottom of because it exerts such an influence on our lives and creates so many problems and hassles and makes peace, genuine peace, something really difficult to realize and experience. So get to, to understand this. You've heard of it before, but do you really fully understand this pair of opposites of male and female. So we can observe all the many, many problems that human beings suffer through because of attachment to good and evil. We can see all the hassles that must be endured. And we can look at these Look at them yourselves and see how destructive they are. And by doing this, we begin to see how appropriate this, this story in the Bible is when God said, if you eat this fruit, you will know good and evil and you will die. 
all these burdens and problems, hassles that mankind must endure is the meaning of death from knowing good and knowing evil. So this, this teaching is very, very appropriate, especially for Christians, that through eating this fruit, man comes to know good and evil, and through that knowledge comes death, which is all the problems that we must undergo because of our attachment to good and evil. So that was looking at things from the viewpoint of religion. Now we can examine it from the view of psychology, that is the science of the mind. We can see how that attachment to good and evil results in dukkha within the mind, that all the problems and burdens, all the hassles that arise from these attachments to good and evil, that these, this, that these are the meaning of dukkha. So when we see it from the psychological point of view, when we look at this within our own minds, examine this within our own minds, not outside of us in society or in history, but within our own minds, then we see that attachment to good and to evil is the cause of dukkha. You can verify this by watching it within your own mind. If we observe attachment, we'll see that it, it happens dependent on stupidity or ignorance. It is only because of not understanding, because of foolishness, because we're stupid, that all this happens. If, if we, when we see that this is just a, pr a process of conditioning, then there would be no problems. But because we're foolish and ignorant, we don't see what's happening. And so instead of being aware and open to and wise about the conditions that are taking place, we go and use our own personal feelings, what makes us happy, what makes us sad, what pleases us, what displeases us. We take these as the measure and then go and attach to things. This is our own stupidity. Attachment only arises when it is helped and supported by ignorance. And so we see that that ignorance or stupidity is the, the cause of attachment. This means that the way out of attachment is to, to see things the way they really are, to understand things, or to put it very simply and bluntly, the way out of all this is to lose our stupidity, to stop being stupid. When things happen, instead of seeing it just in terms of what makes us happy and sad or what pleases and displeases us, satisfies and dissatisfies, just see it as natural processes flowing according to the law of nature, Condition, conditions conditioning each other according to the law of Itapajayata. Itapajayata is the law of causality, meaning with this as a condition, this arises. Or when this condition no longer exists, this no longer exists. 
This is the law of interrelationship between conditions, between cause and effect. When we begin to see things in this way, then we can lose this stupidity by which we're always attaching to things. Instead of seeing as pleasing and displeasing, we see it just as it is, as just this. We see just what's happening, the reality of the situation, the truth. Instead of seeing the superficial distinctions and discriminations which we're always placing upon experience. So to see profoundly in, in this way, to see that it's all just nature and natural process, is to lose our ignorance, to be free of our ignorance, to stop being stupid, and in this way to remove ourselves, to escape from or be free of all this attachment and the dukkha which the attachment causes. We can see that good and evil and the, the value and meaning of good and evil are results of ignorance. One is the, res the direct result of ignorance and the other is the indirect result of ignorance. Through ignorant attaching, these things take value directly for one and indirectly for the other. So, in seeing this more deeply, seeing the problem of this misunderstanding, this ignorance, and the attachment that it gives rise to, seeing that good and evil are just the direct and indirect results of that ignorant attachment, then we begin to see the value of what we call non-attachment. You have to really see how attachment works, how good and evil take their meaning from attachment to be able to really understand the importance of non-attachment. We don't use the word detachment because to detach is just to attach to the evil. Detachment is just a clinging and grasping at the evil. So instead of detachment, we talk about non-attachment, being without attachment, being free of attachment to either good or evil. So we don't feel that detachment is the proper way, but non-attachment, this is the middle way. We don't have to be afraid. We don't have to be scared that non-attachment, that without attachment to good and evil, we will die. God said that through knowing good and evil, we die. So non-attachment isn't death. Non-attachment is, is to live in such a way that it's complete, it's beyond death. And we can say that it's life everlasting or eternal life. So there's no need to be afraid of non-attachment. In a life of non-attachment, everything is possible. It is possible to search To look for money. It is possible to have money and to use it. But we search without attachment. We have that money without attachment and we use it without attachment. Whatever needs can, to be done can be done, but the key is it is done without attachment. 
We speak, we think without attachment. This is what the life of non-attachment is like. So non-attachment is the way out. This is done through, this is realized through what we call vipassana. Vipassana means to see clearly, to see things clearly as they truly are. So through vipassana, things are understood as they really are and then our attachment to them begins to fade away. As attachment fades away, then there is, there is the knowledge of things as they are. And as we live using mindfulness and wisdom, using this knowledge of the things that we need to know, this is sati panya, or applying this knowledge with mindfulness is sati sampajanya, mindfulness and wisdom in action. By doing this, by being mindful and applying the knowledge of things as they are, then there is no attaching to things. And so there is freedom from them. And thus vipassana is very, very important in finding one's way out of attachment and in living the life of non-attachment. So through seeing things clearly as they are, we begin to non-attach. Seeing things clearly as they are means seeing ourselves as this thing we would call we. Don't see it in terms of a triple we or a triple I, but see it as just a double we, the body and mind. But don't add the third we of self. When we say we or I, there's only body and mind, but there is no self. Leave through vipassana in realizing this, then it is possible to live without attachment. Please don't believe the people who say that without attachment we won't do anything, that it takes selfishness and greed and desire to live and act and work in the world. There are certain people in Thailand who criticize us for talking about non-attachment because they claim that for the development of Thailand, for the economic health of Thailand, people need to be selfish, they need to have desires, they need to compete, they need to attach. And so they say that non-attachment is wrong, that we need it. Don't believe these people because they're so attached to things that they don't know what they're talking about. The saying, where there's a will, there's a way. Be very, very careful about this. If what people mean by will is attaching to things, if will is to attach, if it is selfishness, then this is completely wrong. To say where there's a will, there's a way, and be talking about attachment, is wrong, is incorrect. But if when you use the word will, there's no attachment involved. When we say where there's a will, there's a way, we're talking about something that is free of attachment. Then you can say this if you want, but be very, very careful because most people, the will is something of the self, it's attachment. So the way to live is within non-attachment. Don't be afraid and don't believe what some, certain people say 
that attachment is necessary to live, to breathe, to act. The only way to really live is in non-attachment, to be free of these discriminations of good and evil, of clinging to these things and taking on these heavy burdens. These only lead to all sorts of dukkha. Attaching to good brings a good sort of dukkha. Attaching to bad is a bad kind of dukkha. But it's all just dukkha. So the only way to really be free is to stop attaching, to live in non-attachment. This is the true middle, the true, the true way, the way of non-attachment. There's a secret to this attachment business. When there is attachment to something as good, or when there is attachment to the good, then there arises the, the self that is good, or that has good, that wants good, that will get good, the good. When there is, this is a secret mechanism within the mind, or of the mind. And it works in the same way with evil. When there is attachment to evil, then there arises the self that is evil, or that has evil, that is, will get evil, that wants evil, or that doesn't want evil. So this is a very important secret of the, the mind's mechanism that through attachment there arises the self. And this self, when it is full grown, is this thing which experiences all the problems and hassles and dukkha that we've been talking about. Now when there is mindfulness and wisdom in action, applied wisdom, at work, then there is no possibility for this attachment to arise, and so the self is not created. And when the self does not exist, when there is freedom from the self, then there is nothing to experience dukkha, there is no dukkha. So it's crucial for there to be proper understanding, for there to be wisdom about things through having insight into things the way they really are, into realizing the truth of anatta, not self. The things are not selves, there is no permanent essence in all this. To realize itapajayata, the law of causality, that there is nothing but this causal process, that these, this causal, causative relationship between different conditions, that there is just this conditioning. To just see things as they really are in this way, by using mindfulness and applying this knowledge as sampajanya, wisdom in action, this is how to, to be free of dukkha, how to stop the arising of attachment and the birth of the self. This is how we talk about it in, a religi in religious terms. Many people are into art. Art is something that inspires many of us. So if we like, we can call this the art of non-attachment, the art of living non-attached. This is a kind of art, much more skillful and important than any of the fine arts or dramatic arts or plastic arts or, or whatever. This art of non-attachment, of using, of not allowing, attachment to happen, 
In religion's terms, we talk about having mindfulness and wisdom in action governing all that we do, whatever governing, overseeing everything that happens so that attachment doesn't arise. So you can talk about it in terms of art, if that has meaning for you. Or you can see it from a religious perspective, if, if that has meaning for you. What is important is to use whatever perspective you choose in order to be able to be free of this attaching to good and to evil so that there is that dukkha and all the burdens are not conditioned and created to weigh down and kill the mind. So from all that has been said today, you can see that the self is the nucleus of attachment. It's only because of this self that we can attach to things as mine. It's because of the attachment to things that as mine that there is the, uh, the attachment to the self, to the I. So if we can destroy this self, then we can be free of all this attachment and all the problems, all the clinging, all the grasping, all the burdens and all the pain. So we need to be free of this self. That's, this is the way out. To just, to realize the truth that in, in this body and mind there is no self. There is just body and mind, just these natural phenomena. So to put it in very simple, easy to remember, clear terms, we can say this. We can advise you to die before dying. Die before dying. We're talking about two kinds of death the death of the self and the death of the physical body. We don't know how long this body is going to remain alive. The mind only exists dependent on the body. So long as the body and mind are alive, and so long as we don't do anything to cure our ignorance, then we are burdened with the spiritual problem of dukkha, of attachment, of the self. But if we, can, if we can kill the self, if the self dies before the physical body dies, that is the realization of peace, of Nibbana. So we end today with the advice, die before dying. Let the self die before the physical body dies. Die before you die. So on this note, we will finish today's talk and ask that today's mini meeting be closed. Thank you very much.